Exactly. And b- by the way, I was, I'm looking at uh, Annie Logan White's face here, and it just took... If I had to describe it in one word, I'd call it sharp. It's jagged. And it actually explains David A.R. White's face. I feel like he's been eroded down by years <laughs> of jagged face contact, and now he's got that shape. Yeah. Like, like those monks together. that make the super smooth stone, but his face. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because these movies are now officially less terrible than reality. I'm your host, No Illusions, and sitting to my immediate left is my good friend, Heath Enright. Heath, welcome back. Glad to be here, Noah. I'm having a great week. <laughs> Fantastic. And sitting 81 miles to my right is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this pre-apocalyptic afternoon, sir? I'm really great. Now, when I wear the armband, which arm does it go? Have we decided which arm it goes on yet? <laughs> I, just, I don't want to be the guy who wears the armband on the wrong arm on the first day, trying to get ahead. Yeah, no, that is verboten. <laughs> All right, all right, so let's change the fucking subject. So, Heath, tell us, what will we be breaking down today? We watched Holy Man Undercover. Ooh, boy, did we. It's a movie about how crazy the Amish people are, written by evangelical Christian people. (laughs) So it's basically 90 minutes of, like, a guy in a cancer ward laughing at the guy next to him, like, you can't cure it by drinking maple syrup, idiot. <laughs> what? Oh, this? No, I'm shooting bleach up my ass with a power washer. <laughs> you fucking yokel. Read a book. <laughs> and Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you hate minorities and poor people and you love David R. White and silly outfits, you will love this movie. <laughs> This movie is like a wacky comedy written by the KKK. That's essentially what it is. Like, you get to find out what David R. White thinks is funny, and it is terrifying. If there had been a comedy lynching in the middle of this movie, I wouldn't have paused it. I'd have been like, yeah, sure, I can see why David R. White thinks that's funny. (laughs) Oh, it was so bad. All right, so... Monday, we had to do this emergency, like, last-minute re-record of an episode for this show, and Eli got ticketed for putting his face in a cop's lap without permission. And then and then on Tuesday, the future of American democracy was permanently subverted by abject stupidity. And then on Wednesday, we had to watch this movie. So, uh, worst day of the week. Go. Uh, the next 1,528 days of the week until January 21st, 2020, <laughs> yeah. minimum. All tied for worst. All tied. Yeah, no, good answer. Sunday, I I got a tear in my favorite socks. Something about the president? Was there an election? I don't follow (laughs) politics. I'm just not a super political person. What did I miss? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) (sighs) I kind of, uh, yeah, right. Voting's not important. Noah can't stab through Skype, and that's why I'm still here. (laughs) (laughs) And it's a good thing, too. All right, well, so obviously the big draw in this movie was the ability to finally see David A.R. White take on the dual role challenge, right? And we've been saying it for years. Peter Sellers, Eddie Murphy, Davey White. So before we even get this one started, I'm wondering if you guys had any ideas for, like, for David A.R. White's next multi-role challenge. Um, I, I'm going to go with, like, a, a black face character, a yellow face character, an Indian, and by that I mean feather, not dot character, and then a Jew character, just so that we can really wrap him into his own section of the SPLC website. You know, that's really my goal. <laughs> it, started, it all started when they walked into a bar. Yeah, no, I like it. I like it. And is there anything you guys like to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Uh, I'm going to say best worst bad actor incapable of acting any better or worse than he actually is as an actor he's got this tiny little (laughs) talentless zone and he cannot go either direction they try to have him do it we'll talk about it he can't do it uh i've got two uh my first is best worst attempt at creating a catchphrase throughout this movie and we'll talk about it they say holy man and a cover 
about 175 times. And you know yep. there was some nine-year-old running around his church going, holy man, undercover. And everyone was like, stop it. Stop trying to make that work. Stop trying to make holy and holy man undercover a thing. Uh, and the second is best worst woman doing what she thinks non-Christian women do. <laughs> the, the sexy female bad antagonist in this movie thinks that loose women or non-Christian women or movie stars are cats. Just cats. <laughs> she very clearly, the only behavior she can mimic throughout this is cats. Like, she very clearly <laughs> saw someone be like, mm, I'm a little cat. And so she's just like, oh, look at me. I'm shitting in a litter box, huh? <laughs> How unchristian. <laughs> It's nuts. This movie was so a sexy delight. the way she chases a light, laser light around. Yeah, um, I, I had one that I wanted to throw this out for. Like, it was the best at being the worst at being a Christian movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was so perfunctory and 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 just like it felt like a, a like a lazy time traveling Christian screenwriter just got a hold of one of our bingo cards and said, "Fuck yeah!" Someone else wrote out the formula, y'all. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. All right, well, obviously we all need a little more Amish, satanic, G-rated, least salacious comedy right about now, so we're going to keep the break brief, and when we come back, we'll take a deep dive into David A.R. White and his wife. And then we'll get back to recording the show. Ball in a cup, ball in a cup, ball in a cup, hey, Heath? game. Heath, Heath, buddy. Um, damn it! All right, hey. Oh, oh I'm, I, I'm, I'm sorry, hey, dude, what's were up? you, what, were what, you what, ball and cupping? Yeah, man, I was ball and cupping. Wow. It really smells in here. I have not been in your room before. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. Um, I need to do a laundry. Yeah, no, see, Heath, that's what we came to talk to you about, buddy. We, we got a new sponsor this week. Oh, yeah? Sponsor? Cool. Um, Well, if it's Casper Mattress, I was working on a song. I think me and Anna could do it. I'm not telling you, but it's like, it's like when I say Casper, you say Mattress. Casper, Mattress, Casper, Mattress. And then we just... Yeah, like that. Uh, no, I'm not done. Um, yeah, absolutely. Maybe, sure. Uh, no, it's not uh, Casper mattress though. It's actually oh, it's uh, a okay. Mac Weldon. Right. Uh, they make like super duper nice socks and underwear and t-shirts and stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh huh. Hmm. Yeah, and, and and a lot of them are antimicrobial, so they um, cut down odor. Dude. Oh, uh, for someone who might need it, anybody. Ooh. Yeah, by and, any... yeah, everyone could use that. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. So new sponsor. Anyway, I, I was thinking maybe. You would want to try out some of the samples that they sent us. Oh, uh, nah, no, I'm good. Um, I got this T-shirt my uncle got me for eating an entire gallon of chili. It serves me pretty good. It's a, oh, it, it, that's chili on the shirt. No, sweet Jesus. Okay, how about some underwear? Huh? They, they're so sure you're gonna love them that if you buy your first pair and don't like it, then you get to keep them and they'll return your money. Yeah, yeah. Th thanks. For the heads up, but I got these. I mean, elastic's pretty much shot, so I had to safety pin them closed. But you know, they're like, they're like fine. I, I just need I one. I don't know how to. I Again. just can't do this. Look, no Heath, one. at least try some of the socks, man. They're, they're comfortable, stylish, and it's nothing to do with you personally. We just want to be able to tell people that they can go to MacWeldon.com and get twenty percent off using the promo code Awful. You know, Awful. Like the state of your current socks. Okay. Oh, uh, what, what color did they start? Shh, they will hear you. What turns it green? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Welcome to the first writer's meeting of Holy Man Undercover. Now, today what we're going to do is just kind of like... You know, just spitball some fun and wacky things for the Amish people in this movie to do. There are no wrong answers here. Just throw them out. Throw them out. Okay, okay, uh, well, well, you know how they're, like, afraid of technology? I, I do yeah, know that, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so what if they, like, don't understand light bulbs and stuff, <laughs> and we, like, have them interact <laughs> with, oh, I like, light bulbs? Oh, I like it, afraid of like technology. Yeah, good yeah. one, good one. All right, oh, oh, how about the big guy is called Tiny, huh? Because they're Amish. <laughs> they don't yeah, know. Okay, totally. He's small. He's not yeah, right. Off. Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. Oh, okay, what if they're... <laughs> Okay, what if they're, like, worried about their kids leaving and never coming back? Or, or even better, like, if they change too much, they disown them. <laughs> like, 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 oh, uh, no, you've been affected by the outside world. Get get out of my house. Uh, 
What? What? Well, it's just like, I mean, we do that. We do that. Oh. Yeah. Oh, right. Well, okay. Well, okay. Well, what if they're like, what if they're like literally afraid of the devil? Like they think he's a real like person. It's um, coming. D- no, dude, that, that's, that's us too. We, yeah. we, we, we do that also. What, what are you, what are you trying to say, man? No, I mean, I was just trying to think. Of- cause, cause, cause look, we're all trying to come up with fun, wacky, backward behaviors. These crazy Christians are coming up with. And I feel like you keep coming back to, us so like unless you have a problem just just come up with some stupid stuff that they do and we don't so we can make fun of them in our hilarious comedy okay oh, okay are they all right they don't know how to drive cars that's true yeah, they yeah. don't <laughs> have cars <laughs> so, so okay. hard oh, how's your gay brother how the hell would i know i haven't seen him in 10 years right I forgot and we're back for the breakdown, and I just want to say, after the week we've been having before we recorded this, I so needed that Pure Flix logo. It's a weird relationship that David A.R. White and I have at this point. <laughs> I'm, I've talked about this before, but, like, eventually I'm going to run into David R. White, and it's going to be this weird moment where I'm going to be like, hey, man, I've seen literally all of your movies, and he's going to be like, oh, thank you so much, and I'm going to be like, no. 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 <laughs> I mean, no, thank you. Like, please keep, that's literally my job. I love hating you. I love that you make movies, Dave. Uh, also, by the way, um, this movie got 2.8 stars on Pure Flix. <laughs> yes. On Pure Flix. It's only out of four there, but still, people who pay for Christian Netflix rated this a low C minus, just barely a C. It's like a Republican primary. Yeah, it's not well, good. But did you did you check out any of like their reviews? Like why they some of them rated it one star? Because it was too salacious. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And 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 you can tell he's really pushing the boundaries here because like right away the very first thing that we see is him looking into the camera, David A. R. White saying, "I am Satan." You know, the audience, like, gasps, like, no, he ain't, he's a Christian, I done seen it in the magazine. And several people, you know, like, slammed their laptop shut, and were like, oh, Mary, full of grace, I'll be that Oh, God, they tricked me. <laughs> one star, one star, why would you? Why would you, David? You were a simple pastor, and you and your Negro friend were gonna go to Disney <laughs> World. To I'm Disney allowed to say World. that, it's Trump's America. <laughs> oh, because people no. weren't nice enough to me that's what it was so <laughs> so yeah so here's the thing all right I, I have to paint this picture for you because so much of the movie is going to be based on your ability to understand how wacky this is right away we start this movie off with david a.r white in like a leather onesie and a cape Talking about how he is Satan, there are sexy chicks salaciously dancing on either side of him. I promise to stop saying salaciously eventually. But we have to point out the sexy dancing is not sexy dancing. It is no, these no, it's- women's version of sexy dancing. <laughs> you ever seen that scene in a cowboy movie where the bad guy shoots at like a farmer's feet and he's like, dance. They're <laughs> dancing the way that farmer dances. They're like, I think it means touching my hips. I don't, this makes the, de- I'm worried about the demons getting in, about the, hey, Macarena, all right, enough of that. <laughs> Is that the forbidden dance? I can't remember. I think that's the Macarena. Yeah. Uh. Also, we left out. Perhaps the most beautiful thing about this moment, which is there's the sexy ladies, there's David R. White saying, I am Satan, which again makes this the best movie of all time. But there's also <laughs> just a fat guy. There's just a fat, bald guy near the bottom of the screen being like, I'm also here. It's me, Dave the Plumber. <laughs> and if you're wondering, hey, will that character ever matter or mean anything? Nope. That guy's nope. just in the opening shot featured very prominently along with the sexy ladies who will be characters and David R. White. Yeah, he, he donated the most on Kickstarter, I do believe. <laughs> oh, look at me. Gave a thousand bucks. I'm also a devil coming for you. <laughs> You need your pipes. He's like wearing a T-shirt of his company. They made him change out of. I thought Cody's plumbing could be. Hey, all right, all right, showbiz, huh? Where's that craft services? 
and David A. R. White is like going for it here, but he's trying to be, I guess, like a an over the top act. Like this is what he thinks his acting doesn't seem like. This is like where this starts. <laughs> right, yes. And the the whole it feels like a like a Coen Brothers thing, but they lost a bet or or they were trying to win a bet or like a prank war. It's really <laughs> weird. Yeah, what the fuck am I watching was the most prominent note. So we get that and then we and and somebody else and cut or whatever. We're like, oh, this isn't really happening in real life. It's a anyway. And then we get literal cartoon credits, where the, which were by far, I feel like the most enjoyable part of the film. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of fun. And, and I have to point out that at this point I found out because I had watched the preview uh, and I didn't recognize him. And then I saw his name and I was like, oh, my God, that's who it is. Fred Willard being in this movie is less adorable uh, than when he jerked off in that movie theater. I just want to say. <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly. No. Nope, never charged. I, th I think he was. I'm going to Google it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. So now we're going to start things out six months earlier than the, cre the credits, I guess. And we, we find out right away that we're going to get ourselves a down home voiceover from David A.R. White. And who doesn't love a good down home voiceover? Absolutely. I'm Amish. That's why I'm playing a brand new violin. <laughs> the girl in front of me has sunglasses from Empire One. We know nothing about the Amish. Well, it's so funny because like I, I actually tried to look some stuff up before we did this. I'm like, okay, there's going to be a lot of Amish stuff. I don't really know jack shit about the Amish. And, and I'm like, oh, that makes me overqualified for as the researcher movie. for this film. Yeah, you you learn everything you need to know when he pronounces Roomspringa as Roomshabringa. And the characters all pronounce it differently throughout this movie. Me his, his One character says room springa. One character says room should bring him. At one point, his mom just starts at room and then lets herself sort of trail off into Q's and R's and W's. And bring a shrub up. Shrub. Shrubity. He talks like I spell. That's my point. He talks like I spell. <laughs> Yeah, so so they're setting up this uh, Amish community, and we, uh, I'm pretty sure, immediately get a racist moment. So a, a car full of Asian people drives by, and I'm pretty sure they say Godzilla like they that. absolutely do. They and all I, say it together, like yeah. Godzilla, Godzilla, <laughs> Godzilla, which means yeah. that, and this is really important for us to take time with, that means that either one – David R. Wright was doing the racist stereotype or two, and this is what I believe to be true. David R. Wright thinks that's how Japanese sounds. <laughs> <laughs> he might just think like, because you know how we do like, a blah, 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 blah. He might just be like, yeah, no, that's Japanese. Like, Gajira, 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 right? Yeah. I bet if we asked him, he'd be like, yeah, no, I thought that was just Japanese. <laughs> I don't have time to hire Japanese people. <laughs> I actually went back and checked. It's actually spelled racistly in the subtitles with I R's. I would expect nothing yep. less. That's what happened. Um, pure flex. We also get a really good juggler of pins, right, Noah? <laughs> do you enjoy that part? The really good juggler of pins? I'm Googling, like, they don't use plastic, do they? Honest people, that's, <laughs> those are plastic clubs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he must have been practicing that for minutes upon minutes before they... <laughs> All right, and then we get the most unrealistic line that we ever get in any Christian movie and go back to every movie we've done and understand the gravity of that statement. David A.R. White's character says, because it's my 18th birthday today. <laughs> well, they are going to go back on that. They, they yeah. are. They're, they're, but not enough. <laughs> yeah, and not exactly. not quickly enough because we do spend the first 10 minutes of this movie going, oh, David R. White's 18? David oh. waits 18. So he cool. dyed his hair blonde to cover up the gray at age 18. Weird. <laughs> Weird. All right. He's got Benjamin Button. This will be interesting. Yeah. I wonder where they're going to go with this. Yeah, and just to be clear here, he was like 39 when they filmed this. And mm -hmm. and he wasn't like he's not like a young 39. Yeah. So so but it's but he's turning 18 and like we said we we'll we'll, we'll get back to that. So this is his rum spring up party or whatever. Right. Um, is rum springing away party. And we cut to an entirely not Amish event with fancy plastic signs, a band, and a ceiling strung with light bulbs. Literally strung with light bulbs. <laughs> yeah, so, and, and this is where we meet Edie McClurg. He plays 
uh, uh, she plays uh, his mom. And man, does she mail it in. All of the legitimate actors in this movie stare right into the camera and are like, and then my next line is, please, <laughs> son, don't leave. Great. There you go. You got it? Nope. One take. That's what you get. You get one fucking take. <laughs> it says Second it in my contract. Second only to Fred Willard, who does the... The worst performance in this movie. And on purpose. Very clearly on purpose. It, I, I know what an actor only being willing to do one take looks like, and that is Fred Willard in this movie. But she's pretty <laughs> fucking close. Yeah, yeah. And what she's uh, contractually obligated to uh, convey here is that she's very sad because her brother Jehoshaphat went off at Rumspringa and never came home. And she's worried that her son will do the same. And this whole scene we need to point out is just like, look how backwards they are. And there's so many things they have in common that like are just taken slightly forward to make it the people who made this movie. It's like, your brother left and never came back. And we're supposed to be like, ha ha ha. But if she was like, your brother's gay and we abandoned him, we'd be like, hey man, that's totally fine. I don't know why. Why is that in the movie? Why, why, what's that? <laughs> That's a great way to behave. This movie's dumb. This movie's dumb. One star. One star. First, he admits yeah. to being Satan. I smashed my computer just out of fear the way Kirk Cameron told me to. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So now we, we, we move away from the barn dance so that we can revisit the obviously this actor is significantly older than 18 problem. So they, they have him walking with his uncle Tiny who tells him, you know, hey, it, it turns out we've been lying to you this whole time. You're not really 18. He's 28. And I was like, mm, keep going, movie. I'm going to need another <laughs> uncle. <laughs> Maybe it's time for Uncle Skinny, the big fat guy, to come in and explain that David R. White is 75. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. The truth just sounds different, doesn't it? <laughs> So and and they also they try to make a comedy beat out of this. Go, he's going like, wait a minute, that would mean I was still wearing diapers when I was. And his uncle Tiny goes, that means you were still breastfeeding when you were. And then he throws up in the bushes because he was sucking on his mother's breast at I guess thirteen years of age. I don't, I don't know. It helps you absorb the nutrients better. I didn't find that funny. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, so now, you know, we've had enough wacky fun with the, well, not quite enough wacky fun with the backwards Amish. So we get the seeing him off scene where mom's like, call if you have any trouble. And dad's like, we're Amish, honey. We don't have phones. And we're like, oh, that's, that's, they, that, that's off. That's so sweet that they tried to put comedy in there. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, look at him trying a comedy. Also, <laughs> Tiny moment, but this is where dad walks up, and this was written into the script. You can see the actor checking in, being like, I think I'm saying a racist line. He goes, son, the women in L.A., they come in all sizes and colors. Colors. You get it? Color. Lock in with me. Colors. Colors. If you sow your wild oats, sow them in dark earth. You locked in? You locked in? Don't look away. Don't look away. All right? You're coming back to the milk shit. I want you to go out there and get some chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. I'm going to whisper that they want the D in your ear, and that is my part in this movie. Yeah, that's, that's the function I serve. Yeah. So dad's warning him about the multiracial women sexually abusing Amish men, how that's a standard thing in society. Um, yeah. And it's too bad they don't have the internet. They could have shown, you know, some of Eli's websites. <laughs> Could've been useful. True. I've I've sent them to PureFlix, although I think my email is blocked. Yeah, my email's blocked. I get it. Sure. <laughs> I don't really blame them. They're not ready for you yet. That's all it is. And there's, if there's this weird, awkward moment where the dad is like clearly telling his son that he used to have hand-drawn Amish porn. Yeah, I, don't know. I wrote it, my notes. Is this dad going to start jerking off in front of his son? <laughs> this is weird. I don't like this. <laughs> well, and this is one of many times that I wrote in my notes, like, who is this movie for? Because these jokes are, are too racy for Christian audiences. And for anyone who likes racy jokes, they're just stupid. So who is the intended audience here? Yeah, the goal here was very clear. David R. White span around in his chair in front of his writer's room and was like, guys, the goal is without a paddle, too. 
Let's shoot for that star. <laughs> All right, so he so now he heads to Hollywood because while a lot of Amish people, you know, when they go off on their own, want to party and smoke drugs and have vaginal sex, what he wants to do is go to L.A. to be a missionary and spread the word of Jesus and maybe even meet his uncle Jehoshaphat who never came home. And we get the 900th big city montage that we've had in these goddamn movies and the things mm -hmm. that the filmmakers very clearly think are wacky are just so stupid and mild like this cut of a vegan restaurant and a Scientology <laughs> place and you know that the people watching Pure Flix were like, oh, Los Angeles, man. <laughs> How do they do it? New adventure every day. A vegan place, wouldn't they? <laughs> it's just salads? I don't, know. I don't even know. I don't even know. Is is a vegan restaurant like a dangerous vice he needs to avoid? <laughs> it's like Eli walks outside, come try this textured soy protein. <laughs> like, to be fair, based on how people react to my cooking, that is the most dangerous thing that could be offered in LA. Well, I also love that because they try to do this over and over again, this boy, does this guy look out of place in the city? Look, he sticks out like a sore thumb. But as as city dwellers, we know no one looks out of place. There's no way you could dress where, like, in New York, people would be like, hmm, well, that guy doesn't look normal here. We step over the dead in big cities. We step over what? the dead in big cities. There's multiple incidences a year of people stepping over the dead until a cop's like, oh, this guy's been dead for 20 minutes. Come on, people. An Amish guy is not going to catch attention. Well, no, and that's the thing is that, like, the, the scene is clearly supposed to be, like, wow, boy, does he stick out like a sore thumb. But for me, as a person who's wandered around in cities, it's, are we playing Where's Waldo for a montage? <laughs> right. And now it's time to offend poor people. Because, you know, here's the thing. Up until now, this movie was wacky, but it hadn't really shown the ugly side of what these people think is funny. And this is going to be the beginning. Because... He gets approached by a bum who, again, it's a Christian movie, is in blackface. I mean, I smudged myself <laughs> like, up as a chimney sweep for our live show at QED as a joke. This guy is covered in black. He's yeah. not blacked up, like, to be a black person. He's just like, no. poor people are smudgy. Yes, that's exactly, exactly. And he says, hey, man, can you spare a latte? Because it's L.A. Mm -hmm. So the poor people there beg for what? lattes. <laughs> yeah, but they settle for dollars when he doesn't have a latte. So of course, when he when David A.R. White gives one bum a latte, what happens? All the bums want a dollar from him. He liter it, literally the message of this movie is, hey, don't give homeless people a dollar or they'll all mob you and kill you like zombies. We're gonna treat the poor like zombies for the next ten minutes of this movie. Literal so, zombies. So much so, by the way, that if you look at the credits, these extras are listed as Zombie Bum 1, Zombie Bum 2, <laughs> Zombie Bum... I shit you not. That's what. That's how they list these people in the credits, as Zombie Bum. Blackface Zombie Bum 1. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not proud of that moment. It's still on my resume because yeah. there's not much else there. Not proud of that. But yeah, like th this is literally, this is Republican nightmare. And, and the thing is, is it's all delivered with a wink and a nod. Like, you know, cause this is exactly how it happens. You try to give one guy a dollar, they all just suddenly want to drink your brains. At this point, I wrote in my notes, if he takes out a shotgun and shoots these homeless guys in the head, I take it all back. I love this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Another good time to check out an Eli website. Absolutely. <laughs> Now, but luckily, Andrew made me shut that one down because <laughs> murder's illegal. Stop it's saying on the tell deep people killed Don Lennox. Stop <laughs> saying Cristiano <laughs> Brothers did a thing they didn't do. Kylie <laughs> <laughs> Arena didn't kill her daughter. Put that down. Those are bomb making instructions. <laughs> 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 I don't know why we started in first place. All it is, no, no, no. It's a world <laughs> full of rules, man. Sorry, but now luckily for for. Little Amish. The character's name is Roy, by the way. You'll see why I have to tell you that in a minute. Um, lucky for Roy, his uncle shows up to save him from the dependent class. His uncle is also played by David A.R. White. David R. White plays his uncle Brian by putting on a black curly wig, tucking a pillow under his shirt 
like a pregnant lady costume, mm -hmm. putting on a fake mustache and talking the way Noah does when he does a Jewish accent. That is <laughs> how this character is played throughout the movie the entire time. He looks he looks like Pablo Escobar. He looks <laughs> almost exactly like Pablo Escobar. Well, and the, the way I described it to my wife, this character that he's playing is like, have you ever seen that dad whose daughter is like 13 years old and he's trying to make her laugh with the shtick that she only pity laughed at when she was eight, but he still does the shtick? That's his character in this fucking movie. Yeah. It's really dark because you can tell people on set were cracking up. <laughs> at this. You can t I can always tell when someone's been told they're funny when they're not because they're like, huh, how about this? I'm gonna vamp. Like, you know, David R. White walked up to Fred Willard at one point and was like, you and me, couple of improvisers. And Fred Willard was like, if you talk to me, I'll stab you. And he was like, right. Forgot that was in your contract. Okay. Well, those are real guns, huh? I thought those were props. This is not part of the character, is it? It's just to keep me away. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, I understand. I get it. It's, you're not the first. See you later, coworker. One of our actors had a hammer that he used for the same purposes. It was weird. <laughs> but, uh, porn stash David A.R. White says immediately basically is what did you do did you use the j word in public and that's right. the voice by the way you know you can't show the <laughs> word of the lord in public that's and that's like his guess right like this this character first of all it's a coincidence meeting it just so happened that the first person who he happened upon in la was his uncle so they don't even know who each other is at this point but secondly, his first guess is, oh, there's a bunch of homeless white people in smudge face chasing after you. You must have publicly said Jesus, which is true. That is what happens. So maybe that's more common in L.A. than I'm giving it credit for. I'm not a West Coaster. To be fair, I do attack those little Spanish ladies who hang out with the watchtower and the subways. But I thought that was just me. The judge told me it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So we're going to be so the Jehoshaphat character has has renamed himself Brian, which is good because that's easier to spell in my notes. So whatever. So Brian is David A.R. White in a porn stash. And Brian is teaching his nephew about how you teach the word of the Lord in L.A., which is step one, you don't go around using the J word. And this is where we learn something really important about this movie. And we all realized it simultaneously that this movie is David R. White explaining his existence <laughs> to himself. They, I mean, they literally have at least justifying his own profession to himself on screen and literally and figuratively. Yeah, absolutely. This scene is like, look, you can't just walk up and hand someone a Bible. You've got to make, make Christian a movie. Moving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and in fact, the people who make the Christian movies are, 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 the, are the best Christians because they're, they're, they're actually getting listened to. Uh, said, said this character, said this character, <laughs> David, put your wig back on. No, no, no. I got, I got stuff to say <laughs> because I went an audition for soup. And, and, and when I asked for a group prayer with the casting director, they said no. And it, I just feel like I was too young and I maybe had potential and I'm trapped. <laughs> so this is the double down movie. OK, this is where we double down. Um, and, and our notes in this scene are remarkably similar. <laughs> if I don't know if we've ever had a scene where we all, all written down such similar shit. Cause the first thing, this is where they arrive at Brian's apartment. And the first thing we learn is that Brian's apartment is filled wall to wall with guns. There will never be a reason for that, right? Nope. No, absolutely not. And I think that might be part of the reason for the one star. Some guy was like, well, the, well I don't understand why y'all got to make fun of guns. That gentleman seems like he's prepared for when Obama comes. <laughs> one star. You missed it this time, David. You missed it. I love you. I forgive you. You're my brother. You're my wife. You're my husband. But you missed it this time. David. You missed it. You shot too low. You shot too low. Jim Baker buckets make a really nice table. I, found, I, <laughs> I think that's understand. not unreasonable. Well, that's funny to y'all. The prep for the apocalypse. <laughs> Be stupid. All right, so this is where he goes off on his little monologue. Okay, so this character, Brian, owns six TVs that are on when they walk in the door. Now, there is some amazing shit that happens in this little monologue. 
Because he's like, I get 750 channels, but only six of them are devoted to the Lord. So apparently that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the six Christian networks, one of which is cartoons. And he actually says here, he complains that the Christian channels are all lumped together so you don't accidentally come across them when you're flipping through channels. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? Those A sportists do the same thing with the sports channels. Those <laughs> bastards. Like that's how the channels are. You're really, you've really like written into a fucking script that you're complaining about the fact that they don't sprinkle them in. For the people that what? just hold down up through <laughs> 600 channels and are like, not gonna, what? This is also um, where he's like has like a TV montage about how talking it is like, oh, you know, TV is really appealing. If you want to laugh, it can help you laugh. If you want to cry, it can help you cry. If you want fiction, you've got CNN. You get it? CNN. <laughs> they say that there's global warming and evolution. Yeah, and that's the thing. Again, this is delivered with a wink and a nod. Like, and, and that's why I love doing this, right? That, that's when I realize that there actually is some purpose in what we do. When we get those little moments, those little behind the scene wink and a nods from the groups of people we aren't. Right. Like, oh, that's funny to these people. That's why Donald Trump is our president. Anyway, so yeah, okay, I'm going to get depressed again. I'm going to start cutting again. We're going to stop. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. David R. White way. pretends to know what Coke is. David R. White pretends to know what Coke is. <laughs> Tell the nice people at home about David R. White pretending to know seven full lines of table long full lines of Coke. I, I, I love this. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. He, he's got, he's making like a large batch of cookies on a mirror. That's what they think <laughs> cocaine looks like. <laughs> I mean, look, that's kind of a movie trope. So, like, yeah, give right. David R. White some credit. But it's rarely more exaggerated, aside from Scarface, how much Coke is, like, <laughs> the amount of Coke a human does <laughs> than in this movie. It is a huge he line has of Coke. And ramparts, multiple ramparts of cocaine on this mirror. <laughs> the Germans so <laughs> should be driving tanks over these Coke lines. <laughs> So now Skippy goes out uh, into L.A. to win hearts for Jesus. So we get another out of place in the city montage. Right. Also, uh, just a tiny moment here. Did you notice there was another moment with a remote control car? That's yes. two movies now where Christians have been really focused on the miraculousness of remote control cars. Is that an inside baseball thing? What am I missing? Also, He's we get a cut of him like asking a girl if she'd like to accept Jesus and she slaps him and then covers him in cola. And like not even we would do that. And we're like the scathing ones. We put it in the title and we'd be like, nah, man, like I've seen how Noah reacts to Christians. He's just like, you know, your book recommends rape. And the lady's like, oh, no, we don't want to talk to him. I, talk to someone else. I can see you. <laughs> Go away, Cleveland Indians mascot. <laughs> so I, I also love how like they're trying. They're clearly shooting for the you know crocodile Dundee is in New York City kind of a moment where like he doesn't know how an escalator works or whatever. But they don't know how to do that. So like he goes to speak to this surfer and he's like, "Hey, surfer man, would you like to hear about Jesus?" And the guy turns around. He's got a surfboard on his head and he knocks him over. I'm like. That's not an Amish wouldn't know that they, they, they don't they know that solid objects knock them down. <laughs> the, the, the Amish don't believe in reflexes. Oh, I, I see. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so he gets back to Brian's apartment after an unsuccessful day of winning hearts and souls for Jesus. But Brian has decided to take him to an audition so he can be a movie star. And there's this amazing scene where David R. White is like mugging and doing comedy into a mirror. Oh, God. And I just had this amazing dream where like I get to meet David R. White and he challenges me to a comedy off based on this. He's like, oh, really? Eli? Yeah, I've heard your little show. Maybe you saw a movie called Holy Man Undercover. Let's go. Oh, and he's just there weeping is, as he does his mime karate. Come on, people. There is literally <laughs> no one I wouldn't kill to make that happen. I'm just, I'm throwing out John Lennox. If, if, if John Lennox is listening, look, man, you, you should, you should sacrifice yourself really at this point to make this happen. You would bring so much joy to people when they need it most. I'm just, we got a Patreon goal right there. Okay. I love it. The David A.R. White versus Eli comedy, comedy off battle. to the death. To the death. <laughs> <laughs> 
We can do that, can't we, Andrew? In Donald Trump's world, I feel like we can do that. I feel like there will be a law that says we can do that. There's no question we are months away from trial by combat being totally legal. (laughs) And a struggling, sweaty, out-of-breath Andrew explains how they got away with it to Thomas on opening arguments. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, well... Okay, how do I... Oh, boy! Um, (laughs) Wow! You ever make a peanut butter sandwich out of your own poop? Because I did. I did this weekend, Thomas. Yeah, that's one thing to look forward to over the next four years, how increasingly frazzled Andrew is on that show. (laughs) So and we should point out at this point, because this is the third time they say the title of the movie in the movie, The Holy Man Undercover. And what this means in this movie, in the world of this movie, is a holy man undercover is somebody who you think is just out there trying to get famous as a real actor, but is secretly, or any other profession, any job, any just real actor is just the first one that popped into his mind. But in in reality, he's trying to preach to the uh, the word of the Lord by like sneaking references to Jesus into the scripts of other shows or something. This movie. This movie. Oh. Right. Okay. So like, I remember one time my uncle bought me some present. My atheist uncle brought me some present and uh, like, I, I, for Christmas. And I, you look on the packaging and there's just a little like Isaiah, such and such, such and such, you know, the Lord loves you or whatever snuck into the packaging. Obviously designed to go overlooked by the parent who bought the present, but be seen by the child who goes through the, uh, packaging a little more carefully, right? That's the behavior this movie seems to be like glorifying. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. This movie would be like if in when we made a movie, it was just like, well, I mean, I guess the best way to spread intelligence and science literacy would be some sort of podcast that, you know, makes fun of those things that we don't like. I'm just (laughs) top of my head. I guess that's what a a hero with a 19 inch cock would do. (laughs) Who knows if that person will ever come around. Patreon.com forward slash <laughs> free bonus episode every month as well as a commercial free edition of every show. Yep. That, there's also that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they get to the audition. Now I want to talk about the, the audition here, right? Because what we've got is we have a line of about 2,300 people, all of different ages, ethnicities, and some of them are in costumes, one is dressed like Marilyn Monroe. One is dressed like Charlie Chaplin. Just the, oh. what the fuck could you be auditioning for? What the fuck audition could have possibly brought out that group of people? Ooh, ooh, extra in David R. White's wacky comedy about an Amish guy. <laughs> <laughs> I love how they, you know, they reference those two people in history. I mean, just mentioning them is funny. Charlie Chaplin and Marilyn Monroe. And it doesn't matter if there's a reason. Yeah, but but also, clearly. We have to talk. So Andrea Logan White, David R. White's wife, is in this movie. And Heath, you noticed something about this that I didn't because I, I never remember his her, his wife's name. I just remember she's his wife. What's her character's name in this movie? Oh, <laughs> yeah. So her character's name is Annie Logan. And uh, her name, <laughs> her real name is Andrea Logan White. And people and call they, her Annie. And they went with Annie Logan so she wouldn't. Be confused, but but you know what? I, I don't know if you guys remember this, but we've we've noted that before about David A. R. White. How often his characters' names are David? Yes, or, or or last named White. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I love this this because when we first meet her, right, she walks out, and everyone, all of the people in the audition, are going like, "Oh my God, that's Annie Logan! That's Annie Logan! Oh look, it's Annie Logan!" And I guarantee that that's like in her rider. Which that was is his like, birthday present to her. Yeah, exactly. It's like, like, okay, I'll be in your movie, but all the extras have to act like they recognize me and I'm famous. <laughs> it's like method also, scripting. Yeah. Just a little uh, behind the scenes here. Okay, all the actors trying to stuff their headshots literally inside a casting director is realistic. But I, I feel like that's just broken clock twice a day stuff. I just want to say, <laughs> I don't think he actually knows about that. It's just something we had to do. So, so now she escapes into the alley, right? Annie Logan escapes into the alley. We have not shit on homeless people enough by making zombies out of them because sometimes they're also armed thieves, right? Yeah. So this homeless guy comes up to her and says, like, 
Could I get some change, lady? And she is such a vile bitch about giving him change that I wanted him to insert it into her nostril afterwards. <laughs> or just put it up his own ass. Just be like, oh, okay, I won't spend it on booze. <laughs> is that okay? Can I use it that way? Here, tell you what, why don't you write me out a list of things that I can spend this money on and then I'll fuck it. And then I'll fuck the list in front of you. <laughs> Uh, and he's like, I don't need a lecture, lady. But we're supposed to be like, we, the Pure Flix viewers, are supposed to be like, ungrateful. See, this, this is why if they're going to die, they'd better do it. Ooh, what's that from? I think that's a Charles Dickens quote. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like Charles Dickens. But because, hey, she dared to tell him not to spend it on booze, he pulls out a gun and decides to rob her instead. Yeah, exactly. And look, I can't even tell, right? Because she goes give, goes to give him the money and she's like, you better not spend this on drugs or booze. And I can't, because like later on in the movie, this character is supposed to be like a hard-hearted bitch kind of character. But I can't tell if this is part of that setup or not. Well, she's just trying to make America great again. I see. You know. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm depressed again. But then David R. White comes out. Yeah. And and we get to see how David R. White understood the that's not a knife scene from Crocodile Dundee. Because look, <laughs> again, the movie trope is like not being afraid of a gun or disarming the bad guy to save the girl. That's pretty normal. But like David R. White's character just isn't afraid of guns because the Amish don't believe in death. Like what about that I character? Don't... Yeah, right. It's the classic scene where, like, this character's particular set of skills are supposed to be, like, show up at the right time at the right place for him to meet the girl or get the job or whatever. But his particular set of skills are just, like, he lectures the, 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 the robber about Jesus and then takes his gun. Right. But he, not That's willingly. Not... He just sort of snatches it away and he's like, give me that gun. And the guy's like, oh, oh, oh. right. Hold on to gun. Fuck. That's on me. That's on me. <laughs> Also, there's a point in this scene where, like, because he's talking to it, would you think Lord Jesus would like the fact that you were doing this? And he takes the gun, and now he's got the gun aimed at the guy while he's evangelizing. And I thought to myself, this is what they beat off to, right? This is what Christians, they see, oh, evangelizing at gunpoint. Oh, one day, oh, one day, yeah, that Trump really gets good. into office, and oh. <laughs> and so the homeless guy runs away and throws himself in a dumpster. Comedy! Comedy! Uh, and, and then David R. White turns, and this is the series of events, so it's very important. David R. White turns to have, like, the meet cute with his wife, Annie Logan. But in the background, and I do not know if this was on purpose, the homeless guy proceeds to struggle out of the dumpster. <laughs> It's Which fantastic. means I was unable to pay attention to anything they were talking about <laughs> because there's this big fat guy being like, get a hand here. Is this, you know, they called cut. Oh okay, God, you know what? I'm good. I'm good. Just bring me. Okay, three, two, one. Oh God. And and meanwhile, in the front, it's supposed to be like, oh, wonderful to meet you. I have no idea what was said. Yeah, right. So yeah, he saves her life. She owes him one. So she's going to make him famous. And that's a plot. And now we cut to him and Uncle Brian. And Uncle Brian is warning him about those damn casting agents by uh, some nice, subtle racism. Was it oh, subtle? Not really. No. <laughs> All right, so he basically, he says, if we didn't have failed actors, the people in the food industry wouldn't speak English. That's a paraphrase of his joke. And I just wrote, you know, it's funny because it's true, doesn't work in both directions, right? You can't just swap <laughs> with because you can't just put them on either. Say, yeah, no. There'll be a wall soon, don't worry. <laughs> oh, God. And now it's time for my favorite scene in the movie. <laughs> this scene is where the movie goes from terrible to official hate crime. <laughs> Is this the car wash scene that the you're car wash referring scene. to? Yeah, so they have to go to a car wash so there can be Mexican stereotypes. And what are those Mexican stereotypes doing? Selling trucks because they're Mexicans. They're probably raping too. We just don't see that on screen. So this is a drug selling car wash. And these two like ganged out guys come up and they're like, hey man. What kind of car wash do you want? And he's like, hmm, I want the one that's the druggy one. And they're like, okay, <laughs> brolo, get in the car, mine. <laughs> and so they get in the car and they roll down the windows for like wacky comedy car wash with the windows open hijinks. 
There's never a reason why they would have done that, right? They, they don't even attempt to explain why that would be pivotal. It is literally just like, you can't go through the car wash with your window step, David. <laughs> That's All it. Right. That's it. You are killing me. <laughs> uh, you know, they say I don't like edgy comedy, but <laughs> with the window step, that would ruin the upholstery and everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a funny guy. He's a funny guy. I could have a beer with David R. White if I drank, but I don't because it's the devil's liquid. <laughs> and th- so, yeah, they're going through with the windows down, which is wacky. And then the Latin guy pops up from the back seat. He was there the whole time. Who knows? Right. And then sells him Coke inside the car wash. And then everyone gets arrested. This is how they think buying drugs works. Yeah, yeah. A, a guy named Pinky and the Thumb dressed in horribly racist Latino costumes in a car wash with the windows open. Yep. Yeah. Is that that's is that not how you guys buy drugs? That's how I. Buy drugs. <laughs> my, my drug dealer's name is Daquan, and he's always eating watermelon. God. Okay, and so now we cut to Annie. And her friend, who's also kind of a character, but kind of not, you know, she's in the movie. She's in the movie. And they're talking about whether or not she'll ever find a good Amish man to fuck her or something, I guess. And to contrast Annie and her weird, like, inbred looking friend, (laughs) like, she's a very, this is a very strange looking character. I can't really describe it, but to contrast them, the friend, like, when the waiter comes over is like, Hey, you and I are going to fuck later. And the waiter's like, great. This is how L.A. works. And she's like, awesome. Anyways, what were you saying, Annie? (laughs) And Annie's not like, that's a weird thing to do at a meal. She's just like, yep, this is what people do in L.A. We (laughs) created AIDS. And I love, too, that, like, the, the, the friend says, oh, that waiter, he looks delicious. And she says, well, he's vacuous. And I'm like, that's a hard charger after ordering a fucking meal from the guy. You don't know. You could be a fucking physicist. You could be studying. You don't yeah, know. he didn't quote Proust when he took your order for soup, so fuck him. <laughs> yeah. And at this point, Roy calls her to help get out of jail. And, and this, again, movie trope, but the whole, like, can you come bail me out? And then people forget that, like, bail doesn't mean that you're not charged with the crime anymore. It just means that you don't have to wait in jail. Like, again, movie trope, but it's just something yeah. I wrote down in my notes. Is like, this movie really doesn't know how jail works. No, you pay the $200 or you, or you roll the dice. Yeah, exactly. And, and then you go free. Yeah, exactly. Or in our case, call Andrew. <laughs> Yeah, and so now apparently, like we get the whole like they're they're leaving the 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 jailhouse because now he's free because that's how bail works. Um, and the two of them are obviously falling in love. So she asks him out via her assistant. And first of all, one, why is her assistant with her? And two, he hands him a list, and he's like, "Here's all her face, favorite places to eat. Here's all her favorite music. You might want to have it on the car, and uh, this is where her G-spot is, right there on the diagram. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, this is how Hollywood people date. But <laughs> but meanwhile, his, his Uncle Brian was getting prison raped by a large black man. Huh? Hilarious. Uh, it's Because ra- rape is so common in prison. It's a huge, huge problem. And uh, look, I, I want to be clear here because, again, you know, we're not saying that you can't make rape jokes. Obviously, there are some rape jokes you can't make, like the ones I have highlighted in Eli's notes. But you can uh, like I'm not saying that up. like, oh, this is a subject Unfair. that can't be funny or whatever. There's some great prison rape jokes, but it has to be more than this guy's going to get fucked in the butt against his will by a larger guy. Well, and a lot of men, more than women even, get raped because of prison rape. So, you know, there's reason for this to be. uh, It's not that funny. It's not that funny. Trump's America. All right. So, yeah. So now we get this great uh, comedy moment. Okay, so the first step in getting him famous was getting him a job at doing a commercial voiceover. Because that's really that is the the first step towards uh, fame and fortune in Hollywood. And again, they just don't get it, right? Because like he's sitting there in the recording studio, and they're like, "Okay, go ahead and put the cans on," and he doesn't know that that means headphones. So he picks up the beer cans that are sitting there, 
And then they're like, no, the black thing. And then he puts headphones on. Like, okay, everything in that room was black. Like, you have to at least, you at least have to go that next step. Like, in our skits, we wouldn't get, you know, we wouldn't forget that much. Keep of it the, consistent. It's <laughs> something. <laughs> your your anyway. world needs rules, David R. White. I know you don't listen to our show, but in case you're wondering and you want to take another crack at comedy one of these days, the comedy world needs rules. When you follow those rules, it's empathetic and surprising, and that's what makes people laugh. All right, there you go. That's just for you. I don't know if anyone out there can give this to David, <laughs> but for Holy Man Undercover 2, apply I, as needed. I happen to know that at least one person who knows David quite well listens to this show. So oh, that's true. It may Maybe, maybe he hears it and well, but then, but you know what? You might've just fucked it up. You might've just fucked up the fucking goose that lays the golden egg here. Oh my God. What if his movies just start being great? <laughs> that would suck. It'd be I'm all worried. your fault. <laughs> I'm not You're just watching the movie cracking up going like, no, I never should. I unleashed it. So, okay. So we got, can we talk a little bit about the commercial that he's filming? The wink and the nod that we're getting here. Yes, it's very clearly like, all right, now, David, you're reading about a depression medication, but it turns out it's got all sorts of side effects. So you've got to read them like they're a good thing because we try and sell people on the on the like good parts of it. And we're going to trick everybody into thinking medication's the way to cure your depression because, look, we've been pretty racist and we've made prison rape jokes, but we haven't made people kill themselves yet in this movie and we want the full row we want the full row christian movie bingo look this could <laughs> not more clearly be the undercurrent of this scene i i mean you know like we 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 sometimes like for the sake of comedy we we like overread the racism instead of saying but you could not possibly more clearly be saying depression medication is stupid in this scene right okay so they're selling a drug called Calmo. That's brilliant. I love the idea that a few people sat in a room together and came up with Calmo. Yep. Um, and he has to do the voiceover that reads the side effects. And the guy tells him, like, make him sound, make each one sound even happier than the next one. So we get this great comedy moment where he's going, blood in your stool, and diarrhea, exploding testicles, or whatever. That's, that's the gag. And of course, the last of the side effects is depression, which is what this drug's supposed to treat. But then he realizes he can work the word of the Lord in there, right. which is supposed to be a good thing. So he's like, uh, the side effects may include depression, Ephesians, Jesus loves you, and blah, 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 blood in your stool, and Christ is in John 3, 16. And yes. that never comes back. It's, it never plays into anything. It's just like the scene. Well, right, because, again, this is their effort to glorify those people who snuck Jesus uh, passages onto the fucking packaging for a toy that my uncle unknowingly gave me. Like, that's the message of this movie. That's the holy man undercover bit. And like you said, it doesn't play into the movie at any point. Whether The only thing we're supposed to take away from this is cure your depression with Jesus, not drugs. And he's going to be famous because he's so good at saying blood in your stool while make it, making it sound like a happy thing. So now we cut to prison where he's visiting Uncle Brian and time for more of that prison rape thing because he's got a husband now that he's in jail. Can you imagine? A husband. A man with a husband. Another man. That only happens when you're in jail, guys. This is comedy. Yeah. This is comedy is what we're watching. <laughs> also, another really desperate attempt to make Holy Man undercover a catchphrase. Like <laughs> You can tell at this point he kept walking up to people on set during break being like, Holy Man, and they kept being like, undercover. undercover. And he was like, that's right, undercover. <laughs> Watch out. Everyone's going to be saying it. It's going to be like, uh-oh, dude, where's my car? And <laughs> Holy Man undercover. Those will be similar phrases. <laughs> Yeah, so now we get to what, what Heath was uh, referring to at the beginning of our review here. This is the part where he has to audition from the Satan job, and he has to, like, first do it acting poorly and then do it acting well, and those two things are completely indistinguishable coming from David oh, A.R. White. It's amazing. He's so bad, he's fucking up at acting badly. He can't even just... It's This is like George Costanza doing the opposite. Except if Jason Alexander had no talent and, and the opposite of talent is still no talent. So he's acting the same as before. 
Yeah, no, exactly, exactly. It's, you can't, except for the facial cues of the, like, casting directors and stuff, you can't tell when he switched from bad acting, comedy, comedy, to good acting. There's also, speaking of bad acting, a fantastic moment where he's supposed to be distracted by Andrea Logan White putting on lipstick. And so they do, like, a slow-mo, her putting on lipstick sexy thing. But Andrea Logan White has no white, she is camped down her sexual desires and womanhood for so long that she's just like taking large bites out of it, out of the lipstick. She's just like, hey, mm, is this the sexy? Sometimes when I do this, I think about Barack Obama. So I'm just going to put it on my chin and then I'll paint two rosy circles. I'm a little dolly. Dolly. <laughs> it is the worst slow motion sexy. I could do oh, a better slow motion sexy lipstick. And if you message us, I will send you that video. Ah, gotcha, Andrew. Gotcha. They, now they have to ask us for it. So, so I can't get in trouble again. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, just don't tell them where you'll be putting the lipstick and you'll be fine. They, they asked. Um, so yeah, so. It's around a hole. This is, we, and we also, we have to uh, mention. <laughs> it's my butthole. <laughs> Thank you. I lipstick around my butthole. Clearing the- <laughs> and then I give each autograph a little kiss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. I kind of want to stay in this joke, but I'm kind of terrified <laughs> to. Um, so yeah, so, okay, so, but he, she's looking sexy and everything. And we didn't mention this when it happened the first time. I can't believe that we didn't mention. The Psycho Machia moment here where David A.R. White's alternate character, Uncle Brian, pops up on David A.R. White, the Amish guy's shoulder Mm. to tell him what to do in the audition. Like a little devil or angel, we don't really know which. And now it's time for Fred Willard to look like he's acting at gunpoint. (laughs) Honestly, Fred Willard is one of the funniest, best comedian improvisers probably ever. I mean, truly a a brilliant, brilliant actor. And he is mailing this in. He's saying his lines as quickly as possible and as dead-faced as possible. He's just like, hey, I'm a movie producer. Yeah, uh, no, I, I don't want to see people acting. I want to see – if I want to see real people, I'd go to a bus stop. Look, I've got guns. Guns are funny. All right. <laughs> that's that's done? the scene. You know, ev- they had to do like really hard cuts because he always finished every scene with, we done here? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So what we're going to learn here is that Fred Willard is crazy. He's like the Yosemite Sam a movie producing. Um, and he doesn't want to cast this Amish hick Roy, but he will if Annie agrees to cast Tiffany Towers. But Annie has vowed to never work with Tiffany again. Tracking plots like that is my job. Yeah. It's my job to try to sort that out and pay that much attention. But yeah, that's what's going on here now. Yeah. He doesn't want to hire somebody that has exactly zero experience for this role. What an asshole. How does that apply to current events today? Hollywood. <laughs> you guys think of anything? No, I can't. I've shut it out. I built a wall. So, yeah, so, and also, of course, this whole time we've been teasing at the big date bef- between, uh, 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 Annie and David A.R. White's character. So now it's finally time for him to come crashing into her driveway because he's so Amish and we can make fun of Hispanic people more. Also, like, he has this, like, I can't believe what a big house she has. Like, oh, these fancy Hollywood millionaires. And it's like, dude, you very clearly live in a giant mansion made of prayer. Like you, just because Hollywood producers don't lie to people about burning in fire forever if they don't go see Inception doesn't make you better than them. <laughs> You're probably richer than a lot of Hollywood producers and a lot of Hollywood producers send a lot better messages than you do. So maybe spare us the like, oh, Hollywood big city houses as opposed to the humble mansion I'm sure David R. White lives in. Yeah, I think you might be overestimating it, but yeah, yeah. Um, and also, can can someone explain to me what we were going for with the lazy, unfriendly, pregnant Hispanic maid? Oh, that that's the premise of a joke, and then it's over. That's how they do <laughs> jokes in this movie. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it never made any fucking sense. Like he, he shows up to this door, and there's this just like obviously go fuck yourself attitude chick with a bare pregnant belly, 
standing in front of him, staring at him. And then Andrea Logan White shows up and it's just like, oh, that was, you know, Mexicans, they're always pregnant and looking at you like you just said something you probably shouldn't have said, even though you said you liked Speedy Gonzalez cartoons, which is a compliment. Reference Mexico. You get it. I guess. I don't know. So then we're going to go to this restaurant. And we're going to meet this guy whose whose ability to do accents is so bad that I can meaningfully make fun of it. Yes. Oh. He, he, at first, he's like Boris and Natasha had Richard Dawkins stroke. It's just like, <laughs> it's in me. Hello. Welcome to my restaurant. You know what it is? It's a communist accent. He's doing a communist <laughs> accent. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, so it, this is supposed to be the restaurant owner, I guess. He's got like, yeah. he's doing a gay Spanish stereotype accent. Eli mentioned this before. It's like the KKK community theater put on the birdcage. <laughs> and this guy's playing Hank Azaria's part, which was probably like Europe, Mexico faggot in the script or something. <laughs> But then he starts using German words well, right, too. Well, right, because he's doing—he's clearly doing either a French or Italian accent with German words. Occasionally, it's Japanese and sort of generically gay. Yeah. I got all of those things from his moments on the screen. Yeah, right. And and they're supposed to be at like a super fancy restaurant, but it's just like a high school gym strung with the same Christmas lights they had in the Amish <laughs> scene. <laughs> right. It's like, wow, this is the nicest. Uh, Christmas lights cafe in the city. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where we kind of start teasing. Okay. Cause so like Annie's so important that they kick the people out that were at, at the table. It's just so that she can have a table right away. And he's like, boy, people sure do like you in this town. And he's like, well, that's only because of my first big hit. Med school confidential. Like, okay. Cause someone can, can, did anyone get an idea of what this, okay, so, so she was supposed to have produced a reality show that was really popular about med school students trying to marry a supermodel who then murdered the Rahm mayor Emanuel. of Chicago. <laughs> yes. Well, it was just before he was the, I believe. Um, but, but yeah, but at any rate, what the fuck was going on here? I have no idea. All I know is I really want to watch that show. That sounds incredible. <laughs> Can we get some funding for that? I'll make med school confidential. 12 Harvard med school students trying to win the heart of a model and the last episode involves murdering the mayor of Chicago. Come on. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> it would sell. It would sell. Yeah. Well, you and don't want to watch that. Everyone at home. Oh, I'm so much better. You totally would watch that. Also. OK, so we're supposed <laughs> to get some more Amish people don't know how things work moments. And again, they swing and they miss. Because one thing that I bet Amish people do know how it works is fire. <laughs> right? Because we, we, we have the moment where he's like, he accidentally lights his menu on fire because he doesn't realize that there's a candle. I'm like, this is a person that lived without electricity. Like, he would be better than us at not setting his menu on fire, wouldn't he? Wouldn't that make more sense? And, like, as the this is getting increasingly dangerous, she's just sitting at the table doing the whole, <laughs> he's so country. <laughs> yeah, she thinks arson is adorable. Yeah. Also, tiny moment when he brings up the menus, he whispers into her ear, try the duck. It doesn't suck. And you know that that was like something he improvised. He was like, you know what? I'm going to get this extra line. And he did it. And David <laughs> Irwin was like, hey, man, hey, man, I know you made up that line, but you nailed it. And we are keeping it. <laughs> you owned it, man. You owned it. I don't know if you realize this, but those words rhyme. It just yeah, They just it flows. I don't know if you did that. On purpose or what? I'm going to be an outlaw biker in a movie next year. Do you think, <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? <laughs> so now it's time for them to take a romantic walk on the beach. Uh, and there's a great moment where Andrea Logan White is supposed to be playing devil's advocate. And she's like, aren't you saying that you're right by being a Christian and I'm wrong and I'm going to hell? And he says, no, I'm not saying I'm better than anyone else. And that's not the fucking question. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's literally exactly what goes on. She's like, aren't you saying you're right and I'm wrong and I'm going to hell? And the answer to that is, yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. So he just goes, no, I can't jump higher than you. I've never seen your vertical. <laughs> <laughs> right. But now, it, it, and, and it also, even if you accept that the question and the answer match up, then basically what she would be saying is, aren't you saying you're better than everyone else? And he would be saying like, 
no, I use different words or I sound like an asshole. <laughs> right? I mean, like, even if you accepted that that was what she was asking. So he's like, no, I'm not being judgmental. It's just that I'm happy because of Jesus and you're all sad, is what I'm saying. <laughs> Exactly. And by the way, I'm looking at uh, Annie Logan White's face here, and it just – if I had to describe it in one word, I'd call it sharp. It's jagged, and it actually explains David A.R. White's face. I feel like he's been eroded down by years <laughs> of jagged face contact, and now he's got that shape. Yeah. They like those monks together. that make the super smooth stone but his face. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> So she invites him in to, to fuck her, but he's Amish, so he's not going to. And this is where they go for comedy, and they – I, I want to say they almost get there because I just feel like we should throw him a bone at a certain point. But this is where he's like, oh, now suddenly all those Amish health films made sense. And the film is a flip book because they're Amish. It's right. a flip and, book. and it shows a woman and a man about to fuck, and then she kills him as the devil – and and again, that is your message. That's right. what you do, guys. Right. Your message in this movie. You didn't even step out of this movie <laughs> to send that message. You know that? Right. Do well, like, that's, that's the thing is that the I guess maybe to them the only comedy is that it was a flip book, right? It's like it should be actors playing out that correct message. <laughs> Yeah, th th this is just to be clear. A Christian movie just made fun of the sex ed class that Amish people had. Yeah. It's like Pol Pot making fun of Hitler. Yeah, right. <laughs> so now we cut to like after the date, she's in the tanning booth with her friend um, chatting about whether or not they would ever consider dating someone who isn't famous. Because that's, you know, it's L.A. and you won't date people who aren't. Yeah. And so she goes to tell him, hey, I'm famous. You're not. So we have to keep our single data secret. Well, obviously we're all on pins and needles while we wait to see how that relationship shakes out. So while we have you all tingly with suspense, we'll take a quick break. But before we do, let me give Act 3 the hard sell here. Will Fred Willard outwit that wascally wabbit? Can the cast agree on how many syllables Rumspringa has in it? Do you think that the chick that plays Tiffany would be into like maybe something with me and Lucinda together? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the script ends here conclusion of Holy Man Undercover. Okay, everyone. Welcome to Anonymous Racist Caricatures in Christian Movies Anonymous. I'm Steven. I see we have some new faces today, so why don't we why don't we just jump right in, fellas? Hi, my name is Pinky, and this right here is my friend at Thumb. We recently were featured in Holy Man Undercover. Ooh, that's a bad one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like we were in this car wash with the windows open, and I was dealing drugs while David R. White got all covered in soap, and I just said to myself, what is this joke, you know? Like, if this is a wacky car wash joke, that's one thing. And this is a racist Latino joke, it's another. But I couldn't do both. And, and that's what I decided to get help. And well... Except for this voice, I haven't done anything stereotypically racist for six months. Very good. Well done. Very good. Well done. Now, that's fantastic, Pinky. Remember, we're not as racist as we're written. Oh, and yes, you? I'm going to sue everyone here for the applause I just heard. When your hands were together... It looked like praying. Oh, that is guys, I, sorry. It looks like Eddie the Angry Atheist is having a relapse. I need help. You do. <laughs> and so I was like, excuse me, you need to learn to... Uh, hi, hi, where are the scallions? Excuse me, sir, I'm in the middle of a conversation. No, I can see that, that a you are. Anyway, so yeah. I was like, whatever, she's not but even really work. for real. So, like, I need to go because yeah. there's, like, an old Native American woman here who needs scallops. Scallions and male. Sorry, sir, just... what? Okay, look, at this point, both of the guys I work with just order Blue Apron. Sir, and... we don't have aprons. Can you no, hear me? No, no aprons. No, Blue Apron is a food delivery service. Like for less than 10 bucks a meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Is that like Meals on Wheels because you're so old? Like like an old ghost? If I drop a can, are you going to cry a single tear? Is that what no. we're doing right now? No. Well, that sounds boring. 
actually, new recipes are created weekly and are not repeated within a year. So mm. it's not boring. Okay, but, like, I don't eat fish, uh, so I couldn't do the Blue Apron because it's bad for you. Fish gives you autism. No, okay. <sighs> Ignoring that, actually, you can change your food preferences for a variety of diets. Like for your missing old man teeth, do they have that? Can you see me? I'm a girl. I'm a right, girl. This is what right. a girl looks you, like. And you work here. Can you point me towards scallions? Oh, we don't have any. This is a grocery store, and this is the only place to get food, so, like, sorry. Uh, okay, hold on one second. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash godawful. You will love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash godawful. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. You're going to have to pay for all of that. Yeah, I know. Where, where do I do that? Oh, we have these robots that are impossible to use. They're all broken. They're over there. Of course you do. There's one, but there's a, a man just standing by it, just desperately swiping a can. Just desperate. Never going <laughs> to scan that. <laughs> and we're back for more of the comedic analog to push an limp dick against a dry vagina. And we're going to start off with the big press conference where they're going to unveil the new show where he plays Satan in the Satan Variety Hour called Dark Watch. Yeah, and they do basically like a, here's the cast for the new show, which, I mean, look, I, you know, maybe I just missed out on that happening at pilot season, but I forgot where they introduced the cast in person for like a pseudo <laughs> press conference on the set. Yeah, like somebody tell me what this goddamn show is. What is Dark Watch about? What kind of show is it? Um, Tiffany Towers is a whore. <laughs> <laughs> also, the devil is there. Well, because we keep seeing clips. Like, at the very beginning, we saw that clip where they were, like, you know, just, like, purring and meowing and rubbing their butts against poles and shit like that while he talked about how he was Satan. And then later we see a little a ditty that happens it's just it's i don't yeah i don't think they really thought that through at all it's just like it's a show and there's the devil that's it's it a show you know tv yep. all devilish and sexy that's that's as much as our audience knows so that's <laughs> as much as we know. <laughs> i guess that's it that's it they're like well if it's sexy and it's got the devil them them tv folks would probably love it and i figured that's all they needed also this is where tiffany towers like really doubles down on this performance and this is the first time but not the last that i wrote this actress has no idea what sexy women look like this actress has no idea what sexy women act like this actress has no idea what human beings act like <laughs> <laughs> because she just keeps going <laughs> and we're all supposed to be like oh my god she's like a little cat like fuck I guess, or we're supposed to be going like, yep, that's what those L.A. women are like, feline. <laughs> well, and Secular values, love it. <laughs> and what we're picking up on this scene is like when they first introduced the cast, everyone's like, who gives a shit about those people? And then they're like, and Tiffany Towers as the girl in this show or whatever and everybody's like oh tiffany towers oh, uh, uh. and of course in the background as the as the reporters are stumbling over themselves to get a, a question into tiffany we hear somebody say is it true you're dating bill clinton bill clinton jokes we're gonna get quite a few of those we're gonna <laughs> get quite a few she's naughty and and he dates naughty girls and yeah and in response she makes cat noises into the microphones <laughs> again it's terrifying it's this so is weird. what this actress either what the lines they wrote for this actress or what this actress thinks human beings behave like is a terrifying insight into the christian mind like we, we talk about this quite a bit but like this show among all the things in the 65 movies we have now watched this give, 65 plus movies we have now watched on this show it is most of all a terrifying insight into the christian mind that like secular women can can't speak they just like <laughs> 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 
Well, it, it was so weird about this. Okay, like, okay, so this this actress that plays Tiffany is smoking hot, mm-hmm. but like, the more cat shit she does, the more I'd be. I'm like, yeah, see, now I don't. I'm I'm seeing it less and less. You're <laughs> this is the opposite of what you're going for. But yeah, exactly. And the the the, the press conference, I guess, is going wrong. Or something we don't really know, uh, but the producers realized that the way to save this is if they could get Roy, the Amish guy, to date Tiffany, the cat lady. Right, and it, it's very clear here that they're trying to do like a singing in the rain situation, like a oh she's the bad, like gross popular movie star, and our, our main character doesn't want to have anything to do with her, but like. They're doing it in this weird, horribly clown world because now we cut to her being like, I'm not dating him. I dated Bill Clinton. Did I do that joke? (laughs) (laughs) Well, and this was an odd moment for a Christian movie. She goes like, there are two things that are going to matter to the audience and I control both of them. And she sticks her boob towards the camera in case you didn't get it. Right. Very Clearly, now, this is a boob thing. Credit where credit is due to this movie. There is one funny moment in this movie because when after she says that, Fred Willard, who we've established carries guns all the time, reaches into his pocket and everyone reacts like he's going to shoot her. And then he pulls out a <laughs> handkerchief and he's like, what? That was funny. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to shoot her for being a bitch. Oh, no, he's not. I feel like the audience that this movie was intended for was like, yeah, god damn it. You, you go ahead, Fred. <laughs> I'll, I'll have your back. We were fishing the whole time. Stand your ground, you Fred. Me. Stand your ground. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Roy says, well, she's not my type anyway. At which point, Tiffany goes, I'm everyone's type. And again, <laughs> acts like a cat and start starts making out entirely one-sided with him. Like, she's like the U.S. presidents of making out with Roy in this scene. Um, and she, she's just like, blah, 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 just smearing her face back and forth across David R. White's very clearly happy but pretending not to be face. And then yeah. she can't believe that didn't win him over. Which, to be fair, neither can I because non-consensual kissing of David R. White, I am a towel rack right now. But I, I get, I get what the movie was going for. Yeah, this was right. I mean, very few things would make this woman unattractive. This is one of them. <laughs> yeah. is, except to Eli, apparently. It, it's like, it's like watching a beautiful woman vomit at the bar, but, but in a way that's not attractive. It's right. not good. <laughs> sure. It's like that, but bad. You, you should use better metaphors. No one's going to understand that one. Do you want to edit that <laughs> and come up with something that's not so fucking hot? <laughs> so they go on a date to a cowgirl dance club thing yeah it's very clearly a high school gym but that's cool that's cool <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah it's, it's supposed to be this like big packed dance club but it's very clearly like 30 people in a small room like part of that gym <laughs> like walled off well right right yeah, yeah exactly squeezing into the corner where yeah. the camera is. And, and i wouldn't have even known that if they didn't show us a wide shot <laughs> and there was no need for a wide shot but that's what happened and it just yeah. looks awful it's like yeah a, and then so they come across the mechanical bull. He comes, he like gets away from the dance floor because it's too noisy and he comes across a mechanical bull. And that is followed by, and this is not supposed to be comedy, like a, fo- a solid two and a half minutes of what are supposed to be <laughs> cheesecake shots of David R. White. Cause look, the trope in the movie is the sexy girl rides the bull and our main yeah. character is like, whoa, look at her go. But because David R. White jerks off to himself in a mirror, we get two and a half minutes of David R. White riding the bull, paused in sexy positions, and all the other characters being like, oh, David R. White, David R. White. Again, this is truly supposed to be like a sexy David R. White montage. That is what they were going for in this scene. Oh, it's yeah. ridiculous. Well, okay, do Amish people... Do a lot of rodeo bull riding <laughs> and mechanical. They shouldn't even be allowed to go anywhere near that. That would just be like a, a rocking horse in their town. But but Roy's crushing it. And yeah, like you said, T- Tiffany's supposed to find this super attractive. But <laughs> David A.R. White obviously couldn't actually do this for real, like actually ride a mechanical right. bull, yes. bull well. So instead of the bull really moving, 
It's just like a shaky camera guy running around it in circles. <laughs> it's going so up and down. Bad. You know, the suspenders, they're like impossibly on or off at different angles. Well, it's look, crazy. There are not, there are never three consecutive seconds of him on that bull. You know that he was just being thrown left and right and they're like, no, no, do it long enough and we'll be able to put together two minutes. We promise, David. <laughs> it's like Shatner and Family Guy. He's just in ridiculous body poses every new cut. It's terrible. <laughs> So it's time for, like, she wants to, like, get him updated to the modern day. So it's time for him to have a pretty woman montage. Right. And he gets a makeover. And what what is so wonderful about this movie is that what they make him over into, you know, backup singer for Nickelback. And <laughs> we're supposed to be like, now that's a good looking fella right there. Clean cut. Blonde highlights in his hair, just as God intended. And the way they show that is when he finally walks down the street, looking like he should be whispering the words, hold me now, under his breath to try to write the next middle school lyrics. You know, his fucking system of a down backup dancer. A random woman comes up and just starts humping him like yep. a dog. Yeah, because he's so sexy. I wrote my notes, I gotta get some of those clothes. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, Andrea Logan White's contract just says everyone has to pretend they recognize me and that I'm famous. And his contract just says, yeah, women are just trying to fuck me left and right. Like, it's literally it's like it's like listening to 12 year olds like on the script that they would write for the movie they would star in. And then this hot chick just comes out and starts just like rubbing all up against me and little short shorts. Oh, yeah. And then we get more of that clever wordplay that the uh, Pure Flix folks are known for. When uh, when they decide to go on their next date to Club Lion's Den. Well, it's it's they double down on it so hard. Yeah. She goes, mm -hmm. I don't know. I just feel like I'm feeding him to the lions. And then the guy comes over and goes, this club is called the Lions Club Den. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted so badly for someone to be like, we're going to ride a lion there. A mechanical on this lion. lion this Put on time. your lion costume. <laughs> <laughs> lions maybe a Christians. <laughs> so and then we get this him getting a famous montage right it's the ghostbusters on the magazine covers montage and one of them is rapture magazine i'm like i bet that's a real thing and then one of them was like hades magazine and i'm like i bet that's not um and <laughs> just fun detail rapture magazine the uh tagline for it is entertainment for upwardly mobile christians yeah oh yeah oh, up, see up, definitely a real upward. thing and and again, like the, like this is such ham fisted symbolism. It's like you get it because he's playing Satan, but now he is Satan, and Satan is him. It's the same thing. It's just like a mirror facing a mirror here. Right. It's like why all the bad husbands in our movies have jobs, right? Jobs jobs make you bad dad, and and and, and popular movies make you bad mo movies. <laughs> bad <Person>. Christians. <laughs> Christians, yeah, that's why David A.R. White didn't famous. Ain't that right, David? That's right. All that's of right. Christian cinema is just, if all of Christian cinema were made by me, every movie would be called Three Inches is Big when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so now we cut to, um, like, filming the show, I guess. And in the show, Satan is fighting with... Tiffany Towers about not getting the right bed sheets. Yeah. And so she smacks him and makes out with him. Right. But she makes out with him for extra long to make Annie jealous. And we find out that w during their nightclubbing, David R. White told her that he loves Annie. So Tiffany's new plan is to make Annie jealous. Yeah. And, and they've got that toe to toe moment where he's like, look, is your career more important than me who you just met in this movie and she's like <laughs> yes yes it is and he's like all right now that makes sense now that you think about it <laughs> yeah yeah so then we cut back to the uh, club where he's like hanging out with tiffany who very much wants to sex with his penis inside of her um, but and he won't no he's a he's, christian exactly exactly and so she wanders off to fuck somebody else and he discovers the the joys of alcohol well she she's like look Annie will only like you if you loosen up a little bit. So have a Long Island iced tea. And mm -hmm. <laughs> then we spend 35 minutes while David R. White's character pretends to drink a single Long Island iced tea and then become blackout drunk. Yes. Literally 
pass out. He drinks a single iced tea, drinks it pretty quickly, but he drinks a single iced tea and then passes out. I got to tell you, that's not a Long Island iced tea. That's a Bill Cosby iced tea. (laughs) (laughs) Well, right, because he's passing out as he's finishing the last sip, right? Like we go through all the stages of drunken and not really because none of it is anything like drunk. It's like fucking kids who got bunk acid trying to pretend that it's really good. (laughs) And that's his his version of drunk and yeah but it ends with him going like why how they get the room to spin around like that so the audience can go i bet that is what it's like when you drink alcohol is that the room spins around oh man that don't look no fun at all i ain't missing out on nothing <laughs> But I, I love – so we get this drunk hallucination now, right? Like where he's dreaming about – Like you do. You know yeah. those drunk hallucinations. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, alcohol is a well-known hallucinogen. And this is the most – I like th- th- this could be potentially really fucking funny. I can't tell if they knew why. But we get this reverse strip tease with Annie where she's like hiding behind a tree putting on more and more clothes – until she's like dressed Amish. Yep. I liked this scene. I liked this scene a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really liked this scene. <laughs> I like My watching her put on rental socks. of this yeah. on Christian movie, whatever cinema.com expired several times because I just kept <laughs> watching this scene. Yeah. So we get an Amish anti strip tease in his mind. <laughs> But then he wakes up, and wouldn't you know it, he's in Tiffany's room, and she done raped him or something. Right, but it was very clearly Christians don't think that, like, that's rape. So he's just supposed he's supposed to feel bad that, like, he got blackout drunk and had sex with Tiffany. Right, yeah. So, yeah, so he wakes up and realizes that, oh, he's in Tiffany's room, and, and, and he must add sex with her. So he goes to tell Annie, and Annie smacks him and then fires him for fucking Tiffany. Right. And I wrote in my notes, you've hurt my feelings. You're fired and, and, and go to jail and give me your arm. <laughs> yeah, might as well. Yeah, exactly. Cause that's how it works in the world. So yeah. And then we get the whole like the, the him hitting rock bottom montage. You know, he yeah. lost all his money and they came and took all his stuff and they don't have the right lens for the outdoors in the beach scene. I'm sorry. Like, like. <laughs> All sorts of terrible things happen, yeah. And we learned that Annie replaced him with Bo Duke well, from the but, Dukes of Hazard. But in his defense, he was not <laughs> hurting anybody at the time. <laughs> so he was the obvious next choice, yeah. And and again, what the fuck is this show? Because this is where now Bo Duke sings a hillbilly ditty about how great it is to be Satan. Yeah, a satanic musical number about the devil believing in you. And and that's when I checked the date for this movie, and I realized that this was very clearly during the election of Barack Obama in 2010. So a huge undercurrent of this movie was, you know, the devil sure seems charming, but... (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, they did they did film this in in 2008. It wasn't released until 2010, so like even to their audience, these jokes were stale and outdated, but that's clearly what they were going to. So yeah, so Bo Duke is now the devil on Satanic Hee Haw. Um and I do want to say though like the uh, of the various depictions we've seen in hell, Bo Duke singing country music is the most hell like that we've encountered. Yeah, it's the most terrifying. I I think it goes um most terrifying starts with Bo Duke singing, and then I think I'm going to go with a normal Christian Jack Chick Hill, uh, and then having to watch Christian movies all the time, which is just the one I live in, uh, and then at the very, very top, above all of it, is uh, Donald Trump being elected president. It happened! I'm sorry. Why do you, I'm sorry. Why do you have to say that, Eli? So I was sorry. doing I've, so well. I was we were all so doing so well. The, the, they were to, scabbing up. Everything was scabbing up until you said that. We just wanted that, to so. do our comedy show. Yeah. <laughs> David R. White's so silly. <laughs> Remember when David R. White was just so silly? What Remember when the audience of this of film interior? wasn't in charge of our country? Remember that? We get a couple more months, guys. A couple more months of that. Soak it in. Yeah. Maybe David R. White will get head of the Oscars. I don't know anymore. <laughs> I don't know what anything is. I just don't know. <laughs> 
So now we get, okay, so like again, he's at rock bottom, so he goes to see his Uncle Brian, and his Uncle Brian gives him the phone number of somebody who can help by giving him a job as a hot dog mascot. And look, if there was anything to cheer me up this week, it's the image of David R. White dressed as a hot dog, okay? I will always have that. When the world ends (laughs) and the bombs are raining down around us, my home screen will still be the image of David R. White sad (laughs) as a hot dog. (laughs) <laughs> and at this point, it seemed like they were making fun of their own movies in a sense, because like this is where he has to have his coming to God moment. So he gets down on his knees and prays, but he's in his hot dog costume because he's like, you know, what would make prayer silly, like praying. No, if you did it as a hot dog. What do you mean? What are you trying to say? Yeah, and he's running around. He goes full Coney 2012 here. He just starts <laughs> running around in his hot dog costume. <laughs> Jesus is free. And the cops attack him for saying Jesus is free. And what's amazing is he gets tackled by the cops. And I don't think this was a mistake. I think they just loved it so much. The cop goes, on the ground, keep your buns where I can see him. On the ground, keep your buns where yes, I can yes. see him. Like they do it <laughs> twice in a row just in case the audience was laughing so hard from the (laughs) wacky hot dog antics yeah and then they beat him with clubs because they're la cops i guess or whatever and they take mug shots but he's still in the hot dog costume he will be for pretty much the rest of this movie now in the hot dog costume and of course also by the way this local arrest for a failed actor going crazy and running out in traffic in a hot dog costume makes the news You know, because there's not a lot of stuff going on in in cities like L.A. So, of course, that's on the news and and Annie sees it. So we get the the jailhouse and Jessica Rabbit Dog, which is what I have her in my notes as, (laughs) is outside saying how she's going to free Roy. And then Annie comes up and is like, I'm going to free Roy. And she's like, you did this. You used him just like you use everybody in the way you got me arrested for murdering Tom Ford. And and then they (laughs) and then they get in like a fist fight. And and I know this movie wanted me to be like, uh oh, a country Christian girl will take out a whore from L.A. every time. But like, <laughs> I guess it's just horrible. It's just horrible to watch. Well, and and look, okay, so like Annie in this in this instance, right, is in every way in the wrong, right? At, at least as far as this movie has has told us, she. In furtherance of her career, wound up getting this girl arrested for murder or something and then like forced her her crush to date another girl who he then got mad at for having sex with, fired him for not fucking her and is now attacking the girl who has come to help him. Like physically assaulting, because it's not like it's not like Tiffany starts this fight and he just straight up punches her in the face. For saying the truth, not even for being like, you're a murderer of the president. She's just like, yeah, you set me up to get arrested on the show that you were in charge of. And she's like, punch, this is comedy. (laughs) What is going on inside this weird clown mind that wrote this movie? (laughs) Who the fuck knows? So, yeah, so they get into a fight. And then, of course, we've got to cut back to inside the prison where he's still in the hot dog suit in the jail. Right. And and Annie comes in and they have the like, I love you. I love you, too. And, and it's a hot dog kiss through the prison bars. And then Tiffany enters in a veil of dry ice smoke <laughs> yes. for no reason. Like, I, again, this movie is so insane. And she's like, oh, we never had sex, which is good because the mo- watchers of this movie would know that if they had, David R. White was going to burn in hell forever. So yep. th- they didn't have sex, but I'm going to sue you with my Jewish lawyer for every cent you've got. Yeah, which rightly so. Right. Again, like this is this is the villain getting what's coming to her in the movie. They just don't seem to be aware of that. And so she does, right? So so Tiffany sues Annie and gets everything that she owns. But it's okay because she was going to go be Amish anyway. Yeah, this movie ends with a an independent movie producer deciding she doesn't actually want to be a successful businesswoman. She wants to be an Amish baby factory. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, now Annie is happy because she does what the fuck she's told like Amish women. But she's also running an Amish 
reality show. Yeah, the, the Amish, Amish guys factor. Try to win over Tiffany Towers' heart. And I just want to say, I would watch the shit out of the Amish factor. If any of our <laughs> people out there, we know we got a couple of people in TV and movies who listen to this show. Make the Amish factor. <laughs> Do it. You'll be millionaires. And, and then we end with a, a message from Satan telling you to vote for Satan. Now Satan's running for president. And again, this is all just very clearly anti-Obama, Obama is Satan comedy that they've worked into their movie. Yeah. No, it's, it, yeah, exactly. Actually, outside of that context, it cannot possibly make any sense. Not right. that it's, it does make sense in that context, but it can make sense. Right. They were just like, while we're having some yucks, don't forget the black guy is the devil. <laughs> <laughs> and people at home were like, oh, they get it. They get it. <laughs> <laughs> and we also get this thing at the end. <laughs> we get this thing at the end where David A.R. White's like, all right, I'm going to do the freeze frame thing. And he like jumps up in the air several times. <laughs> he, and the camera just, they're like, no, we're not going to freeze. I didn't do it this time. And he's like, I don't know. No, seriously, do it this time. And he jumps up differently this time. Doesn't freeze again. You can tell just, they were just fucking with just, him on the last they're like, day. They're no, like, no, 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 go, go run, run out like 100 yards and do it this time. Yeah, like, really high. Exactly, exactly. Jump go, long, go long, go long, David. Yeah. <laughs> I won't move the football this time as you come up. Yeah. And I also, I, I wanted to point this out because like the movie ends with, a couple of random scenes in Amish country between Edie McClurg and the guy who played her husband or whatever. And these are very clearly like these were originally intended to go at the beginning of the movie and they didn't have a place for him. And David A.R. White was like, just stick him in in the end. They're It'd be like so a gag funny. Reel. They got the funny stuff at the end of Liar Liar. It'll be like that. It'll be just <laughs> like that. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, I feel like the only real question left at the end of this movie is why the fuck wasn't this box office gold? So, guys, any notes? I mean, any, like, minor tweaks you'd have made if you could have had five minutes with the producer? Well, uh, I think David A.R. White needs to play more parts. He needs to play everyone next time. <laughs> yeah. Stop holding yourself back. Uh, uh, I got a very, very simple uh, single note. Uh, it's written right here at the front. Um, no, you are. No, <laughs> no, you are. <laughs> and quick before we break down again, I guess that's going to do it for our review of Holy Man Undercover, but that is not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to drown out the electoral sorrows that are going to kick in as soon as you don't have anything funny left to listen to. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. King's Faith. This should be fun. I, 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 I always love the previews that get me like, 90 seconds in thinking, I don't know, Eli, this looks like it could be a pretty, never mind, never <laughs> mind. Yeah. yeah, this movie appears to be black blindside. This is bl well, reverse black side. Black. Yes. Right, reverse, <laughs> reverse blindside. It's about a white troubled kid who's gone to prison 20 times and had 84 foster homes who just needs to Jesus double down. But, but it's got all of the tropes of the like, ghetto kid who comes to the nice family and is trying to get out the ghetto because he's got like old ghetto contacts who are like, where's the money we hid in Jonesy's Ridge? And he's like, I can't tell you for Jesus. And and all the parent characters seem to be talking about in the preview was like, this isn't about the drug money. This is about Jesus. Yeah, I, I love to on the particular preview that I watched. It says like in theaters, April 28th, call and demand it at your theater. So like... <laughs> So the in theater thing is kind of on you, the viewer, right? Like yeah. we're willing to bring this to <laughs> yeah, exactly. on April twenty eighth. <laughs> yeah, we got the thing. In anyways, I got a nice car, got a Prius, so I can take it pretty much anywhere. Uh, just let us know. If theater near you. We'll do it in between shows and chunks. We'll make it fun. Most movie theaters close at like midnight, so we could do like a midnight showing. We're really open to it. This is my cell phone. My the director's cell phone. I also love that they use the word demand instead of ask for. Call. Hi, I I'd like to make a demand. No, it's not. You don't Riot get to for do this that in your theater. <laughs> So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 65 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to every episode. You can also help us a ton by leaving us a five-star review on iTunes and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist and The Skeptocrat, available on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever else podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. All the music used in this episode was 
written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Drafts on Mars and was used with permission. If you like what you hear, hear more by following the link on the show notes for this episode. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm No Illusions, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. Rome 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 it kind of rhymes with humdinger. Pinky and the Thumb built a wall and got billed for it. <laughs> David A.R. White spent the rest of his life getting increasingly pissed when people asked if he wanted the senior discount. David R. White tried to hug Fred Willard at the rap party and he shot him in the throat. <laughs> <laughs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle in a Thunderstorm, LLC, copyright 2016, all rights reserved.